Welcome to the USC Institute on Inequalities and Global Health virtual lecture series. My name is Sophia Greskin, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this incredibly exciting event, MPOX, Learning from Effective Science and Human Rights-Based Responses. Uh, this event is done in partnership with the UCLA Center for Global and Immigrant Health, and I think I speak for both of our institutions that we're very happy to be doing this together. None of this UC, USC UCLA rivalry here at all. In fact, it's really been truly collaborative in any way, in every way. So I just want to say on our collective behalf, welcome. Um, I, I just wanted to give a few words of framing before turning it over to our amazing panel. I mean, I think everyone here knows that MPOX was declared a public health emergency of, in July of 2022. And as of the 4th of January, 2023, the US CDC was reporting 84,471 cases in 110 countries. But within that, it's worth noting that while the majority of cases have been in the Americas recently, of all MPOX related deaths globally, almost 80% have been on the African continent. And so with attention to HIV, to COVID, to Ebola, to smallpox, in addition to MPOX, we really see this event as an opportunity to reflect and discuss on the science, but also the structural, the human rights, the community issues that we need to clearly understand and address now with MPOX, but also as we think about how to get ahead of addressing the epidemics that are coming our way moving forward. Uh, we have an amazing panel. Um, I'm going to introduce everyone super briefly. So I ask you please to look at their fuller bios on the website because you'll see this is an amazing group and I'm not going to do anybody justice. Um, but we really wanted to put everybody together in this way. I also wanted to alert you to a hot off the presses brief on these issues that we put together with UNDP. And we're going to give you a QR code for that at the end of the session as we open it up to the Q&A and hear briefly from our UNDP colleague about why this is an area of concern for UNDP. But with that, I just want to move us right into this session. And like I said, I couldn't ask for a better panel of leaders to be in dialogue with one another. So I'm just going to introduce everybody all at once. So first, we have Dr. Joel Bremen, who is Senior Scientist Emeritus at the Fogarty International Center of the U.S. National Institutes of Health. He's got an incredible career. I mean, do look at his bio, but there's two things I want to point out. First is that in the late 60s, Dr. Bremen held key positions at CDC, at WHO, pretty much actually every organization in global health you can think of. Um, but in 1976, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, he investigated the very first outbreak of Ebola as part of an international commission, and he received the Order of the Leopard, which is the highest award bestowed by the government. Okay, but perhaps most importantly about Dr. Bremen for the purposes of this very specific um, event. He did his undergraduate studies at UCLA and later trained at USC um, at the Keck School of Medicine. And he's responsible in so many ways for bringing us together today. And he really embodies that collective spirit. So, so welcome, Dr. Bremen. Um, and then you're going to see that the linkages on this panel become, start to become super clear, right? So let me now introduce Annie Rimoin, who is Professor of Epidemiology at the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health and the Gordon Levin Endowed Chair in Infectious Diseases and Public Health. And she also serves as the director of the Center for Global and Immigrant Health that is co-sponsoring this event. She's an internationally recognized expert on emerging infections, on global health, on surveillance systems and vaccinations. And importantly here, she's been working in the DRC since 2002. Nicole Hoff is the Kinshasa DRC-based country director and a senior administrative analyst within the UCLA DRC research program at UCLA. And she's lived primarily in the DRC over the last few years, where she works closely with and has established relationships with the Ministry of Health, with the Institut National de Recherche Biomedical, the Kinshasa School of Public Health, and she's got an established strong focus on monkeypox. Uh, we're delighted to have with us uh, from DRC, uh, with wonky internet connection, everybody, uh, uh, Dr. Placid Mbale Kingabani, who is an associate professor at the medical school at the University of Kinshasa, a medical doctor with a PhD in virology, head of the epidemiology and global health department, and director of the clinical research center at the National Institute of Biomedical Research in the DRC. And last but not least, uh, Greg Gonzalez, who is an associate professor at the Yale School of Public Health and at the law school 
School, who's an expert in policy modeling on infectious disease, on substance use, and importantly, the intersections of public policy and health equity with really more than 30 years of experience on HIV and other global health issues. So you can see what a panel, right? So let me say, I'm going to run this as a series of questions for this amazing panel. I ask you as an audience to please drop your questions in the chat. We're going to come to the questions at the end. So please, as, as the conversation is going, please feel free to put this information out. And I'm going to ask to start, if each of you could just orient us to the kind of work you do, you yourself, your work and your work with MPOX specifically, just so folks can get a sense of who you are and the framing that you bring to this conversation. Just, I'm gonna go across my screen. So Annie, you're the first person I see, if you wouldn't mind going first. Well, sure. I mean, I, so first of all, I just want to thank you for putting this together because this is really an amazing panel of, of people that, that really spans the entire history of MPOX here. And I'm just honored to be a part of it. So so thank you for, for really leading the charge. And I was glad to be able to follow. Um, so uh, so I'm Anne Ramoyne. I, um, I guess your question is really, it, the question is, I mean, is it about where we are or uh it, where we think about where we are with mpox or is it do you just are even, even more basic even more basic just the kind of work that you do in addressing mpox just the kind of work that you do well um i have been very lucky to be partnering with uh placide and his collaborators at the at the inrb um, notably jean-jacques moyembe who i started my work with um, many years ago, but Placide and I are co-PIs, and actually Nicole Placide and I are co-principal investigators on several projects, uh, all related to MPOX, um, one being a, a project funded by DITRA, um, the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, to um, set up a monkeypox threat reduction network, uh, and wherein we are using DRC as a training site to be able to bring partners together from all over Africa uh, to be able to, to better understand uh, how to do surveillance, outbreak investigation, uh, and, and to, to manage monkeypox. And this was funded actually long before, um, and it, was, it came up in discussion 2015, 16 maybe, Nicole, is when we started talking about this. And um, was actually, it came to fruition in uh, 2020 or 2021. So we've been working on this for quite a while and we just launched the network. Um, we're also, uh, doing work uh, related to animal surveillance for MPOX in DRC. We also support the INRB with several projects related to, to, to MPOX and have several projects that are coming forward, including zero surveys and in key populations, including men who have sex with men, uh, in health workers and, and other populations. Uh, and then here in the United States, I'm partnering with APLA, the AIDS, um, uh, the, um, AIDS Project Los Angeles, APLA, uh, where we're doing a, a study, a surveillance study here in Los Angeles, looking at vaccine effectiveness and uh, efficacy and, and other issues related to it. So um, I should also mention we're partnering with colleagues in Peru doing similar zero surveys and looking at MPOX there. Fantastic. Okay, I'm going around my screen. Okay, so, so we're doing that. Greg, you're next on my screen. So I'm the new guy on the block. Um, I thought about monkeypox from reading it in the newspaper. And then one morning, um, LA time, Annie Ramoyne called me up and said, hello, this is Anne Ramoyne. I'm worried about um, what's happening about monkeypox in the United States and its outbreak among um, communities of men and sex with men. Um, and um, quickly became close allies in thinking about what this new outbreak means for, for LGB, LGBTQ communities in the United States and abroad. Um, but help to mobilize uh, really what I consider a national and international coalition of LGBTQ groups to think about monkeypox, think about MPOX, not just in its current sort of outbreaks in Europe and, and, and the Americas, but also its, its long history uh, in West and Central Africa. Um, in our lab, we've done a couple of modeling studies around MPOX, but most of the work I've done over the past um, six to eight months has been really around public policy in the US and, and the US's response to MPOX. Uh, particularly as it affects my community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Placide, you are next on my screen. Yeah, so thank you for putting together this panel. And I'm so happy to, to be uh, among uh, those, I can say, prestigious people and seeing Bremen 
uh, I only read you <laughs> on paper, so it's a pleasure to to see you in person. And it, I'm also happy uh, to be one of the people who work in Kohli, one of the sites where I think you visited uh, during the, the, the monkeypox work that you did in the country. So I'm uh, Placid Bala, as I say, I'm, uh, I'm working with uh, Annie and, uh, and, and Nicole and several uh, MPOX um, uh, study. And I'm, uh, uh, I led uh, from 2008 to 2012, um, a, 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 an observational study on the characterization of uh, um, a clinical characterization of monkeypox with the EU uh, summary. So since then, I'm uh, involved in, in uh, active surveillance, passive surveillance, uh, genomic uh, uh, surveillance that we started recently uh, last year, and uh, also uh, in a clinical trial on monkeypox. Uh, which uh, started uh, a few months ago, um, uh, which is a collaboration with uh, NIH, uh, NIAD, and uh, INRB, and, and so on. So um, I'm really, you know, uh, monkeypox, the kind of uh, uh, where I started my career when I was uh, about like 28. So uh, I, I can say a bit passionate to do the work on monkeypox. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Nicole. Hi, so I'm Nicole Hoffman, and, and as any implicit have mentioned, I've worked closely with them. Um, so with Annie for the past 14 years um, and actually started my research career in monkeypox. So my actual thesis dissertation is on monkeypox surveillance in DRC um, and have continued working in DRC since. <laughs> Fabulous, thank you, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bremen. I'm Joel Bremen at the uh, Fogarty Center at NIH. And I saw my first monkeypox patient actually in 1972 when I was living in Burkina Faso responsible for post smallpox eradication surveillance in West and Central Africa. This was a young boy in Cote d'Ivoire who had recovered from monkeypox. And then um, I lived uh, in Burkina Faso for four years, in addition to previous two years living in Guinea. And uh, fast forward, I went to Geneva uh, at WHO from 76 to, from uh, 77 to 80, where among other duties, I was responsible for monkeypox surveillance. And uh, we continue that in uh, mainly in DRC. And I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. Well, actually, it's perfect, perfect timing because I, I did want to start with something about some of the basics about poxes, about mpox, about smallpox, if you like. And I, I wonder, Joel, can you start by just clarifying something about mpox, like what it is, how long it's been around, kind of just give us kind of the history, kind of to set us up to be able to have the, the rest of this conversation. Sure. Um, the story began in 1958, where the first set of animals in laboratories, mainly monkeys, and that's where MPOX first got its name. These were mainly uh, monkeys that came from Asia, India, Malaysia, Singapore, came into European and uh, US laboratories for research. And from 58 to 68, nine of these episodes occurred. Um, and uh, virtually all were in non-human primates with a few other animals. No humans working in these zoos became infected or sick at all. So it was named at that time monkeypox for obvious reasons. And it was thought to be an exotic zoonosis of no human interest. Until 1970, when the first patient uh, with a disease that looked like smallpox uh, appeared in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo in an area that had eliminated smallpox two years previously. So the alarm bell rang 
because the entire smallpox eradication program was based on there being a non-human reservoir. The virus was uh, isolated and studied in two laboratories, two collaborating labs, one in Moscow, one in Atlanta. And uh, this orthopox virus, meaning the same group biochemically and related genetically to vaccinia, the vaccine, to variola, the smallpox, major and minor, to three or four other viruses that fell into the orthopox virus family, uh, was identified and studied. And it's at that time, starting in 1970, that surveillance, particularly in countries that had eliminated smallpox, began. And from 70 to 80, there were almost 50 patients in six countries in Central and West Africa that reported one or two cases, except in um, a DRC, where over 80 to 90% of the cases had been reported. And then over the next 10 to 20 years, another uh, several hundred cases uh, were occurring, mainly due to passive surveillance. Um, but these were all in areas where non-human transmit, where uh, smallpox had been eliminated. The two major features of this virus and disease were one, clinically, except for one or two features, a lymphadenopathy, um, and uh, the disease could not clinically been distinguished from smallpox. But secondly, and most importantly, transmissibility was very different. This condition did not transmit avidly between humans. It was rare for a second or third generation of transmission of human monkeypox to occur. And uh, the R0 was really very, very low. And where there were two or more cases, it was thought these could very well be co-primaries related to people catching wild animals, butchering them, touching them, hunters, uh, women and men who were um, preparing foods and children who were playing with animals. Lastly, the natural history of the disease was unknown. No animal reservoir had been found in one uh, uh, squirrel near a case of human monkeypox had lesions from which mpox was isolated. And uh, to my knowledge, really, we haven't had the proper ecologic studies to define the natural history. I'm not going to go into that. We might hear more about later. However, some sero surveys, serologic surveys, capturing wild animals, uh, mainly non-human primates, but a lot of other animals, these were catch and catch can, not the most systematic survey, showed a lot of orthopox virus antibodies in monkeys and uh, rodents, pangolin, small anteaters, uh, in West and Central Africa. But really, one of the major research challenges is that the antibody tests cannot differentiate any of these orthopox viruses that I mentioned. So we can't say what is bubbling in these forests. And to this date, that area of defining the uh, transmissibility, of course, the most important to keep looking at that. And of course, natural history is a top research priority. Super helpful. I mean, super helpful. Um, I, I want to remind everybody that you can put questions in the chat because I feel like, like Joel brought up a lot of things that people may have questions about. Uh, Placide, can I, I turn to you and, and ask if you could perhaps take the lead on, on talking about specifically how um, it's transmitted amongst humans, as well as how it can be prevented, how it can be treated, et cetera, just to kind of get that piece of the conversation going. 
Yeah, so uh, as a zoonotic disease, um, uh, mpox can uh, be transmitted um, to human from uh, infected uh, animals and also uh, from infected human. So uh, once a human is infected by, you know, an infected animal, uh, then it can spread uh, the disease among other human. And usually it's uh, within the, the same household uh, having a direct uh, contact. So what we observe uh, most of the time is, uh, uh, you know, it's a direct contact uh, with infected animals. And uh, those animals are, um, um, can be uh, observed uh, in the way that uh, uh, they are, I can say, a sick, for example, a sick rodent or a sick monkey that cannot move, you know, uh, easily, a monkey that cannot jump, you know, in a, in a, a tree, something like that. So, in a, most of our region, as uh, people are living uh, close to the uh, rainforest, they feel like, you know, this is a chance for them to get food for the family because they can easily catch, you know, animals. But this is uh, a sick animal, and uh, most of the time they get infected when they get direct contact with those animals uh, with their like uh, blood and other type of uh, humor that can be, you know, uh, in contact, in direct contact with, uh, with the people. But what we also observe uh, with small kids, it's uh, 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 small kids are bitten by like a rodent and, and so on. And uh, you can see that uh, those uh, lesions tend to appear first at the region where they are bitten and then spread out in uh, the, the body. So as uh, Joe uh, uh, mentioned, um, the transmissibility between human is uh, uh, a bit uh, was rare, uh, but we are seeing uh, more and more, you know, uh, human cases. And even for human who are like, because I can just uh, say a brief uh, thing about that. We conducted 30 years later, uh, a clinical characterization of monkeypox at the same site where uh, Joe and, uh, and your WHO team conducted the active surveillance of monkeypox in the Sankuru. And so we wanted to see if, uh, you know, after those years, uh, as you know, uh, Annie mentioned that the incidence increase of monkeypox increase uh, if the, uh, the, 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 uh, the disease has a uh, uh, change, if the viruses you as the virus charge and uh, if uh, the virus become more infectious but uh, we uh, saw that uh, uh, the um, the transmissibility was a bit uh, not um, uh, pretty high even if we can see more uh, cases among a human in contact with a human but uh, uh, not as described uh, with uh, the, the smallpox. And also uh, during our clinical um, uh, analyze, we find that uh, the, descrip the description of the disease was almost the same as described during the 80s uh, um, uh, active uh, surveillance. And uh, we also find some, I can say, uh, um, cases of like maternal and fertile uh, uh, transmission and showing that, you know, the fetal can also, you know, uh, express uh, skin lesions and, and so on. So there are very few things uh, that I can say uh, uh, were added to what was described by um, uh, Jezek in his, the, the monograph uh, of, uh, you know, uh, monkeypox virology. So, um, but, you know, uh, as we know that it's only, you know, recently that we talk about the takeover in math. Uh, so uh, during our study, we did mostly what we call a symptomatic 
uh, approach for treating the patient. So according to what he expresses, a clinical symptom and signs. So uh, we treat fever, uh, we treat, you know, uh, we provide like pain relief. Uh, we sometimes add antibiotics to prevent kind of, uh, you know, a super infection, bacterial super infection, and that uh, we uh, give like topic to clean the skin and, and so on. So it's a kind of a, a symptomatic approach, you know, to treat the patient. And when there is a complication like uh, uh, bronchopneumonia, so we can like uh, come with aggressive uh, um, antibiotic to avoid any, you know, uh, super infection and then, uh, and or treat those this uh, super infection or something like that. The only thing that we also observe is that we starting uh, providing like colir for uh, uh, preventing high infection, but this does not help uh, a lot, you know. So since the lesion, if the lesion, you know, uh, attack already the cornea. It's uh, you have nothing to do uh, 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 a anymore about that. So even if you know uh, the disease is not, uh, 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 I can say no, the mortality is not pretty high, but uh, we observe that the, um, um, uh, I can say, uh, the handicap that can come with the disease uh, can be really, you know, uh, uh, painful for the family, uh, mostly for small kids, you know, uh, being blind at like a nine, a 10, you know, for, for life. And uh, uh, the way that we prevent it, uh, mostly what we did during our clinical study, it's uh, wearing uh, PPE mostly for people who treat and who are in close contact with uh, 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 the patient, so it was, it was kind of, uh, I can say, um, just not like the PPE for Ebola, just, you know, a lab coat, uh, gloves, uh, uh, face shield, you know, something that just prevent you to be in direct contact with the, the uh, patient. And now uh, we also have the vaccine that can be used, you know, to, to prevent. And uh, in our case, for example, in a DRC, uh, for the surveyors, we also advise that when there is a case in the family, in the household, to have one family member who is already vaccinated against uh, you know, smallpox to take care of, uh, you know, the sick uh, 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 me family member, as we know that's uh, over 85% against uh, mpox uh, and faith. Thank you for that. I, I'm trusting that so, you're that, that you're done because you're cutting in and out at that 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 end. So so I'll I'll I'll, I'll go from from there. Um, you know, this this last year there there's been a lot of attention to mpox and and to kind of essentially the the differences between how mpox has been playing out in different communities and different parts of the world. And there was this declaration of as a public health emergency of international concern. I, I think it's important to just start with kind of what that means. Like, how did it happen? And, and where are we now? And I wonder, Annie, if you'd be willing to start us on that conversation and then just to get other folks kind of in, into that dialogue. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Um, so just to, to be clear, so I am on the um, International Health Regulations Committee uh, that made the determination um, for the public health emergency of international concern. And there are actually other members um, and advisors to this committee that are um, on this call. Greg is an advisor to the, to the committee and uh, Daniel Tarantola, who's on this uh, call um, or on this uh, uh, Zoom, uh, also is a member of the committee. So you have, you have several members of this committee on here, but for, you know, we have a lot of students here and a lot of people um, who actually don't know what, um, a public health emergency of international concern is. And you know, I think until you actually are part of this process, it's hard to understand it uh, yourself and, and all of the, the, the pieces that come into it together. So, so really the bottom line is it's a formal declar declaration from the World Health Organization of an extraordinary event 
which is determined to constitute a public health risk to other states through the international spread of disease and to potentially require a coordinated and international response. And this is usually in a response to something that's sudden, serious, unusual, or unexpected, but it has been used for other, um, you know, it, it can be used for other things as well. And, uh, and in, in principle here, really when, when a committee of experts is called together, it's really to examine the data and the information that's out there at present and to continue to have these meetings, not just a single meeting, it's, it's several meetings um, that you're really determining, is this, is, an extra, is this an extraordinary event that's going to cause a public health risk to other places, to other, other member states through the international spread of disease and does it require a coordinated international health response? Now that seem, may seem really straightforward, but it's not. Um, because there are also a lot of things about definitions here and what does it really mean? And you know, as I think as we've, we've learned over time, it's really difficult to have a black and white kind of scenario where there's no gray in between. Is it a public health emergency? Is it not a public health emergency? Is it a public health emergency in certain places, but not in others? And as we know, an infection anywhere is an infection everywhere. So if we're seeing something in one place really explode, what does it mean globally? Well, that's why WHO calls this group together of experts. And there's a lot of scientific debate, a lot of presentations, and, and, a, and a real, um, you know, I, I think genuine opportunity to discuss what's happening and bring opinions forward. But it is an antiquated system that needs updating. But those updates actually have to happen through a big legislative committee at WHO. It's very, um, it, it's actually guided all by the uh, international health regulations. So the bottom line is, is that um, it's, a, it's a very complicated system that needs to be updated. The principle of it is really terrific to say, okay, everybody comes together and agrees there's something that's happening that needs uh, to be solved. But I think the yes or the, the binary, it is a, an international concern or it's not a, a public health emergency of international concern will be something that in future will be changed because we know that this is really a, on a continuum and will need to be graded as such going forward. So we had two meetings um, before, or it was at the second meeting that we had um, uh, in July that this, that we, that we really came to the conclusion that this was um, as, as a consensus, as a group, because there, there was a lot of, um, of, uh, of you know, different opinions to, depending upon where people were sitting as to whether or not it was or it wasn't. Um, but uh, you know, we, it, there was a, a majority that was in favor of a public health emergency of international concern declaration in July of 2022 at the second meeting, once it was clear that tra the trajectory was, was continuing, it wasn't just a, a blip, I think. Um, and, and we will be having another meeting in February, I believe. I think we have that, that to, to see where we are and, and um, whether the emergency is called off. Uh, so I, I hope that that gives kind of the context for this globally, because I know it's a really big question for, for many people. Um, and uh, please feel free, Greg, if you have any other Same. points yeah. you make about it. Since no. you, you are also on this, in this group, it would be fantastic to hear what you have to say. So I, th I think, you know, there's the, the institution of the international health regulations, the fake, the public health emergency of international concern. Um, and as, as Annie was discussing, you know, whether one gets declared or not is based on the set of criteria that are enshrined in, in WHO documents. I think what might be more interesting to think about is do we need international cooperation and, and coordination to deal with the current monkeypox outbreak? Um, and I think there are questions in the chat from, from Boyan and from Awale and others that talk about how inequality has functioned in this, in, in this, in this outbreak, um, both in the sense that um, all of a sudden you had tens of thousands of cases happening in Europe, North America, Australia, and it became, uh, uh, became a cause celeb for, for, for many people in global health and many people in my community. Yet as, as Placide and Annie and Nicole and Joel have talked about, um, they've staked their long careers on dealing with disease uh, in, in places in the world where it's endemic. Um, one of the things I think we need to think about in terms of, of the reason to have a fake is so we need coordination and collaboration 
Um, but did we have that and see that happen? Um, you know, Boyan is saying, did we get enough equitable vaccine and treatment around the world? Well, no. I was on a call a, few, uh, a couple of days ago um, where somebody from Latin America is saying, guess what? Guess who hoarded the vaccines? Um, for, for monkey for mpox, it was it was it was LGBT communities in the United States and the American government that had the largest um, stockpile of the Genios vaccine and and used it to vaccinate people uh, across the country. While um, Brazil, which has had a huge outbreak um, uh, in Latin America, um, had and other countries like Peru had trouble getting access to the vaccine. When we talk about reagents and test kits for 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 monkeypox, when we talk of tpox and tecumirovat. Um, we're talking about gross inequities, not just across regions of the world, but within the US. Um, as, as many of you know, who followed the outbreak in the United States, um, it, what might have started out epidemiologically is happening in urban white gay communities, um, which you know, ran to be first in the line to get access to the Genios vaccine, et cetera, um, has, has um, as case numbers declined, moved into communities of color, um, young gay men of color uh, in, in different areas of, of the United States, which you know, makes me think back to Sophia's and my work on HIV and it follows the same trajectories infectious diseases do generally. It follows the fractures in our social geographies, whether they're international ones or global, uh, or they're, they're intra, intranational within our own countries. And so, yes, the fake, the IHR declaration is all well and good. Um, I wouldn't hold ourselves to the, to the, the metric of like, is it a fake? Is it not a fake? But did we do the job, right? Um, and, you know, we're, 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 Pretty much through this call, and there's there's a my big fear right now is that there's going to be a mission accomplished sign held up across the WHO, across the American CDC, and other agencies saying we're we're done with this. Cases are down to single digits in the U.S. We can move on. Um, but I think you know we all know from our work in global health that um, out of sight, out of mind um, doesn't mean you, you you've done what needs to be done, particularly when if you're interested in equitable solutions to global health problems. I totally appreciate that. And oh, sorry, go, go for it. And we're, we're like going for it. Go ahead, Annie. I know. Please. Well, this is the this is the fun of this is that we can actually exactly. have a conversation and have these 100%, conversations. 100%. Have. So I think Greg brings up all of the most important points here when it comes to this and talking about global health and equity and in terms of response. We have Placide here who can tell us from the Congolese perspective, because I get these questions all the time from, from the media. Well, you know, what about what about global health inequity and the vaccines? And you know, DRC has actually not requested or wanted the vaccines yet at this point, um, but there have been other, you know, this is just, we're talking about MPOX here. Um, we, we've dealt with this with many other, um, with many other vaccines and, and it's, it's a lot more than just handing people vaccines. So Placide, you know, from your perspective, I would love to really understand what do you think um, has has been, um, I guess, a, a, a positive in the response, and what has been a negative in the response, or lacking in the response? Can I can I can I can I piggyback on the question and just kind of yes, say, okay. may I do that? Okay, just to kind of come in, I'm coming back into my role as moderator, but it's like I, I just want to kind of play with that a little bit, which is just to talk specifically. Mm -hmm about government and institutional responses, right? As you're responding yeah. to kind of Annie's point and just like, you know, the difference between like what's real, kind of how, how this works and just thinking about the health system, the larger legal and policy frameworks, just kind of that piece of it. So friendly amendment, okay. Yeah, I think uh, for me, it's uh, uh, what I call mostly the sad part of, uh, you know, the global uh, response. This is not for the only for monkeypox, but this is what happened for all diseases, you know? And we know that, for example, recently, uh, the disease that caused like a global emergency, uh, except COVID-19, come from Africa. And we know that in most of those countries, those diseases are endemic, you know? For example, just, just an example. So uh, we decided to declare uh, uh, an outbreak of monkeypox in DRC. When this outbreak started, when will we be able to declare the end of this outbreak? Since the disease is endemic in the most of the area, since I don't know uh, for decades, you know, it's a uh, it, it doesn't uh, work like that. You know, we need to learn from our, our you know our mistake to know that. Uh, now the world is a global uh, village. So people can uh, traverse, we see now, we thought that maybe MPOX 
was mostly just for like some African country. And then uh, after we discovered that, you know, uh, Europe, uh, USA, and many, many countries that were also infected by by monkeypox and, uh, and, and so on. But now uh, the situation is just is that we are not going back to the normal situation since there is no uh, issue anymore in most of those countries. And uh, we are uh, tending to, uh, you know, to uh, forget it. And even this, uh, you know, for me, uh, personally thinking, uh, the this announcement of, you know, uh, monkeypox as a global issue doesn't really change, doesn't really have an impact uh, in our country where the disease is pandemic. We didn't see uh, this, you know, support for like, you know, uh, uh, research and, and so on. And so uh, I, I was just talking with, uh, you know, our uh, uh, director of the national program, when you know the announcement of uh, uh, monkeypox started, you know they thought that maybe this will become like Ebola, you know, with uh, too many people being involved, you know, doing mini research and and so. On. And I told them just <laughs> well, I was laughing and telling them that you know uh, this is just an excitement and this will, <laughs> and in few months we will stay alone, you know, doing the same thing that we are <laughs> we, we we are doing. So this is true, you know. So uh, I think uh, in most of our country, we have uh, this health system that exists with uh, those national programs. For example, in DOC, we have the monkeypox national program, uh, which, you know, uh, do kind of, uh, does kind of um, uh, um, passive surveillance and active surveillance in a new area affected and they report cases like uh, every year, every month, you know, uh, of uh, monkeypox. But the fact is that uh, in our country, there is a huge gap between, you know, uh, for diagnostic of, of, uh, uh, of, of monkeypox. We, uh, I can say, improve for for like Ebola, for example, after you know the West African outbreak, the uh, the, the Eastern, the the North Kivu outbreak, but for monkeypox, uh, you know, uh, it's only last year that you you starting we starting to see some commercial uh, PCR, you know, uh, diagnostic tests. Uh, before that, we needed to rely on CDC to get you know uh, a PCR test. Uh, for, for for monkey posts. And so uh, these are, I think, a uh, few things that uh, unburn our surveillance uh, uh, system in, in, in the country. And this is why we have more suspect um, mpox uh, cases than confirmed uh, uh, cases. And when it comes to the global uh, 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 response, you feel like, you know, the situation is less uh, urgent in an endemic uh, country than in, uh, you know, uh, epidemic country. So I think we need to think about it. And regarding, for example, the vaccine, uh, who, uh, uh, what kind of strategy of vaccination you will use in uh, endemic country? So we cannot just transpose what we are doing in uh, epidemic country to endemic country. And this is the same thing that's happened with COVID-19. We are having a lot of vaccine that are expiring. Nobody would like to use it because the situation in uh, uh, West countries is not the same in, in Africa, you know? And uh, when we do this kind of a surveillance in the country, we see that uh, many people have already, you know, a kind of a immunity against the disease. So they are already in touch with disease. Do you need to vaccinate those people again? Because uh, the disease is already endemic in cancer. And I think we need to uh, uh, think about it and maybe uh, in terms of a public health, to orient our action, you know, uh, according to, you know, each context. I totally appreciate that. Nicole, do you want to add anything here? I feel like we, you've been quiet, so I already want to give you space. Um, yeah, no, I mean, just to, to echo Placide, um, it was interesting once the, the public health de declaration was made for MPOX in that typically in DRC, we see between three and 4,000 suspected cases a year um, and something that was meant to make it more equitable of showing the whole world and the number of cases was actually something that maybe 
impacted negatively DRC because we went from seeing 3,000 suspected cases to what was it at the time, like 168 confirmed cases. And so we started hearing, oh, well, there's not a lot of monkeypox in DRC because they were basing it on kind of the, 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 the worldwide metric of having a confirmed case. And, and I, I mean, Plessy, you're, you're sitting in Kananga right now. You came from Kole, and it's taking you three days as a human to get to Kinshasa. This is where all of the samples are tested. So, I mean, we see also huge delays in, in how long it takes for even a sample to get tested if it does make it um, to Kinshasa. So I think thinking through the definitions and how we're defining things is is really important in, in a country like DRC where so much and, and other African countries that have been reporting monkeypox in, as an endemic location, these are important considerations that really like we should, we should be talking about more. Is it feasible to test every single person who's a suspected case of monkeypox currently in DRC? I, I mean, probably not. Um, but is it feasible in other developed countries? Yes, but like it's not holding it to the same standards. Um, so, and, and piggybacking even further off of that, just thinking through the amount of research. I mean, a lot of my presentations that I give or, or topics that we talk about, we cite papers from 2000. So up until May, there was maybe less than 500 publications um, on monkeypox. And in the past four months, that's numbers quadrupled but almost none of them really focus on kind of the endemic countries. So, no, thanks. I, I really appreciate that. Greg, do you have anything you want to add to this? Look, I mean, I think what we're all talking about is a pattern of, of uh, panic and neglect that we see with, um, with, with in global health. And as Placid and Nicole have said, um, if you wanted to worry about MPOX, you could have worried about it for the past 30 years in, in DRC and other regions of West and Central Africa. Um, you know, it plays out domestically too, after the advent of antiretroviral therapy in the United States, nobody cared about AIDS anymore, although we have a, a, a flourishing epidemic in the American South. So unless we figure out global inequities um, within regions, within continents and across the globe, we're not gonna address these issues for any, with any long-term sustainable solution. And I think, you know, it's sad because you keep getting these lessons, whether it's Ebola, whether it's MPOX, whether it's HIV, you keep getting the same, um, we keep doing the same thing over and over again, the cycle of panic and neglect, um, leaving many people who are on this call holding the ball when, when global attention is, is, has faded from the immediate crisis. 100%, 100%. I mean, I, so, you know, I mean, for the sake of time, because this hour is just flying, um, I, I, what I want to do is I, I want to kind of put out kind of a, a, a couple of questions to the panel, and I'd like everybody to respond, and then I'm going to open it up, okay? So so just in terms of kind of where we are, and, and, and I, I think, you know, one of the things that is, I think, really signaled by the conversation that we've been having are structural inequalities, right? I mean, like, we're really clear that that's really what we're talking about, and, and I think that that impacts MPOX, it impacts epidemics, it impacts just kind of the way that we think about the global health infrastructure and kind of where, where we are. And, and I, I just wonder in terms of just thinking about, you know, there, there's no magic bullet, there's no magic way to do this, but, you know, what are some of the kind of key things we could be thinking about to actually start to address this in a real way? Like we all talk about it and besides the talk shop piece, but the actual kind of concretely. So, so that's kind of my, my, my first kind of big sort of bucket of question to y'all. And then sort of my, my second bucket question um, is the fact that everybody that, that is connected and it is, all, is, is on this panel is somehow connected to doing research and to be thinking about whether you're based in a research university, you work with a research university. And, and really, I think the question is, if we wanna be thinking about structural inequalities and we wanna be talking about them, how can this actually come better into the ways in terms of thinking about how it is that research is done, especially in terms of thinking about epidemics going forward? Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna ask each of you, so, um, can we go, um, who wants to go first? Any, anybody, any, any takers? Um, or I'm just, or I'm just going to call on you. Okay. Well, let, let me, let me just do it. Um, Annie, can I call on you first, please? Sure. Absolutely. Well, I'm, I'm going to be most interested in what my, what my colleagues are going to say, but I'm just, so I'm going to be really brief and I'm just going to say, you know, we, 
the, the issue of structural inequalities is very, very difficult and complicated to address in global health because the system is set up this way, right? I mean, we, we, we've not stacked the deck for, when we talk about global health, the countries that need to be able to do the work here. So I'm gonna give you a perfect example which is that you know we we talk a lot about training and we talk a lot about opportunities for people in low resource settings and we can do a lot of training but if people have to go back to their own countries and get to to do the work how are they going to support themselves where are the jobs how are they going to get the grants you know that it just the, the the funding just doesn't exist and i i think that it's it's one thing to to give a little bit of training here and a little bit of training there but what it requires is deep deep infrastructural change in how we fund work, how we prioritize work, who gets the funding, how the funding is, is, is needed out, and then also, you know, how we value academic work. You know, I bring this up all the time that, you know, the, the world has changed. We work very, we are so lucky, for example, to be working with our colleagues in DRC. Um, and that they've embraced us and allowed us to continue this work collaboratively with them. But you know they need to be leading the work over over there, and you know our our universities aren't really necessarily structured well to be able to support people in the high resource settings jumping into a career in global health and working with our colleagues in low resource settings because everything is set up to evaluate you on how much money are you bringing in, how many first author publications do you have, et cetera, et cetera. We need to share all of that now. It is not people coming in and doing this on the other side, and we've tried really hard to do it. But it is very complicated and all those discussions need to be straight up front and honest and open and NIH and other funders really need to think that about that as well as how to support both sides to work together because just to say it isn't enough. Isn't enough, totally. Um, Nicole. Yeah, no, I, I really, I mean, I feel the same way. And I mean, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I get to be based in DRC. Um, and have really embedded myself within the INRB, but it's definitely uh, been a struggle because especially in the past few years, we see the capacity really starting to increase, but the, the ability for finding funding and, and really continuing a lot of the good research is, is difficult. Um, and, and I mean, like we cite, like I mentioned, we cite a lot of papers that came out from early 2000s, the 1980s, certainly a lot of Joel's original work. And, and I mean, we see the current outbreak happening. And the question is, well, did we miss what was actually happening in the DRC because there was no funds to actually do any monkeypox research in the past 20 years? Um, and then we haven't necessarily seen the pace catch up to say, okay, well, let's go back and try and look at that now that we know that there's this kind of worldwide outbreak. Totally. Placid. I think uh, uh, I don't have uh, much to add to what Annie and Nicole say. Uh, I think we are, uh, I don't know if I can say lucky <laughs> being in an area with uh, several uh, endemic uh, diseases and uh, also having the ability to uh, do research and collaborate with uh, colleagues like Annie, Nicole, who also, uh, you know, uh, help us to, for example, chase, you know, fundings to do, to, to, to do the work uh, in the country. And uh, we uh, are also lucky uh, since we have the technology in the country, so we can uh, now, for example, use the new technology like sequencing and so on to do the work in a country. We have the capacity to conduct a clinical trial, for example, for the two bees working, but uh, um, how is about, you know, uh, how is it working? against the clade one, which is more severe and, and, and so on. And also, you know, regarding the vaccine, you know, we can see some maybe uh, immunological um, response um, with the CDC uh, uh, study, but uh, we know, do we know if, you know, this uh, uh, vaccine really protect against uh, the, 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 the uh, cleared one, you know, those are a few questions that we are trying to, to do. And I um, can say that I can say that I'm lucky 
uh, to have uh, uh, several collaborators, not only outside Africa, but also within the continent. Uh, we work with our colleagues from uh, Central African Republic, Nigeria, uh, Republic of Congo, you know, to see how we can, uh, Sierra Leone, how we can work together, you know, to tackle this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, disease. Super helpful. Okay. Thanks, Greg. So I said the university that takes 60 to 70 percent of every grant dollar in indirect costs. Um, Stan Vermont, who's our ex dean at Yale, and I were on an NIH panel, and he whispered into my ear, "Do you know how much foreign institutions get in overhead costs? Zero. And we made a huge fuss, and we were able to get NIH to put, I think, eight to ten percent into foreign indirect costs. Um, we operate in an extractive fashion with our foreign partners, right? They will get some direct costs for salaries and equipment." But Yale and UCLA and USC, all of our institutions exist and train students and train clinicians based on the indirect costs they get. So there's, as Annie said, this is a deeply structural flaw in, in the way NIH funds research and MRC, and we can talk about all the other institutions. The other piece is a little bit of what Daniel Tarantola is saying in the Q&A. Um, these issues are not just structural in, this, in the sense that they're, they're NIH focused. Um, we know from the struggle for antiretroviral therapy that if we're going to change the calculus and in, inequity in terms of vaccines, diagnostics, treatments, um, there's going to have to be a, a civil society component to this. Um, and we see it for AIDS, we've seen a little bit for TB, but we have not seen it uh, on, on the sort of broader level for global health. And that's one of the great regrets for me that um, coming out of this, this, this public health emergency of international concern, we haven't built an international robust civil society response that will outlast whatever WHO decides in February. Thanks. Joel, please. You're muted. Yeah, I think for me, incentives are the most important and self-interest have to be respected. Um, people will not work unless they're paid. And the day of voluntary workers out in the field should be absolutely over. Uh, the village health workers who are now doing, in many areas, multiple uh, disease surveillance, uh, they're quite often volunteers for guinea worm, for polio, for nutrition, for neglect, other neglected diseases. They have to be paid to do the work, and that has to be in the budget. I think, as Greg said, now overhead costs have to be um, put in budget. And also, a second component has to be, tech, well, it's usually technology transfer, but training as a requirement if you work in the country. So those things are days of the past. Let me mention that when I talk about self-interest, as we are speaking, new microbes and threats are percolating now in the forests of Africa, South America, and Asia. And they will be with us. It's the microbes genes versus our wits, right? That will forever be the challenge. And surveillance is the most important component of detection, diagnosis, and then turning those issues into action. In regard to surveillance. We now have new and modern methods of surveillance regarding uh, biomathematic modeling, and we have uh, biologic testing, which is rapid bedside types of things. We have to get those out in the field, train people to do them. But I think it's at our peril if we don't do those things to detect new diseases, re-emerging diseases, such as malaria, and um, certain enteric diseases, cholera here and there, and then the self-made, human-made perils, such as anthrax, such as the Aum Shirukyo attacks in the uh, subways of Japan and elsewhere. We have to be able to, to detect those. But they are with us, and um, Tony Fauci's great slide of 10 new infectious diseases every decade we have to deal with. They will always be with us, and we have to detect and work together with those things. 
We have, sorry, all, we have like one minute left. What I want to do is I want to turn really quickly to Boyan Konstantinov, who's at UNDP, um, who was the lead author on the, the issue brief from UNDP that I mentioned on MPOX. And I, I just wanted to know, Boyan, do you want to just give us some very quick reflections in our last minute um, in terms of basically anything that you've heard here from the panel and any reflections that you have in terms of why this work was considered important for, for UNDP? Thank you very much, uh, Sophia and colleagues. I'm honored and humbled to uh, join such a distinguished company. Um, indeed, uh, UNDP uh, partners with the uh, USC Global Health to develop an issue brief on MPOX. I have shared the link uh, in the chat. Maybe you can put it also in the Q&A so our participants can, can access it. Um, it took a while, like everything in the UN, and everything changed while we were developing the brief, including the name of uh, the disease from monkeypox to mpox. One thing that didn't change was no vaccine and no treatment for African countries. And I think that that's a very, very strong message that we should follow up with. And I am really very impressed with all the intellectual input and the personal field experience that we heard uh, today at this webinar. Um, there are some actionable recommendations at the end of this issue brief. They focus on human rights first, on community engagement uh, in the responses, on science, um, and on uh, building systems for health. But the one that I would like to emphasize is solidarity. And we heard a lot about this uh, during the discussion here, that we need a paradigm shift that we need a new approach to public health emergencies, not only NPOX, but other public health emergencies, that hoarding is not acceptable. And um, the barriers actually are multiple and, and various, and they are closely tied to stigma, to racism, to sexism, to homophobia and transphobia, and they all must be addressed. And that enabling legal and policy environment uh, have a role to play um, in order to facilitate also equitable access to health services, supporting local production and technologies and sharing of know-how and diagnostics and treatment and vaccines, et cetera. And most importantly for us at the UN, as Brett mentioned, we should not congratulate ourselves and say mission accomplished unless this mission is really accomplished. 100%. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, everybody, for this like this incredibly rich panel. Let me just put up the slide. Boyan mentioned, can you put it in the chat? I can do you one better, which is that I can put the slide up with the QR code, so you just have. Which I didn't even know we had the technology to do this. And so, if you just if you uh, put your phone up, you could use this QR code to be able to download uh, the the link if, if it is that you wish to do so. But I, I want to close by thanking this amazing panel. It the, the the hour went way too quickly from my perspective, but it was really, I think I learned a tremendous amount. And thank you. And thank you to everybody in the audience. And let's just keep it going, right? There's a, there's a lot of work to do. Let's just keep it going. All right. Take good care, everybody. And, and see everybody later at some point soon. Thanks, right. everyone. Thank you.